So I think we should get started and I'll be trying to monitor who's coming in the waiting room as we go. Um, so welcome everybody to Preservation Connecticut's talking about preservation, saving Connecticut's farmland. We're really excited for this um, discussion today with our special guest. But for those of you who don't know us, let me quickly tell you about Preservation Connecticut. We are the statewide nonprofit historic preservation organization established in 1975 by a special act of the Connecticut General Assembly as the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation. And we started in January doing business as Preservation Connecticut after some branding conversations and a lot of full um, looking towards the future and, and how we wanted to continue to deliver our mission. We decided Preservation Connecticut was a nice clean way to enter 2020 and um, with some renewed um, vigor and enthusiasm for our mission. Uh, we are a staff of eight. I'm Jane Montanaro, Executive Director. Chris Wiegren is our Deputy, Deputy Director and our resident architectural historian, editor of the Connecticut Preservation Newspaper, and he administers our easement program. We have three circuit riders, Brad Scheid, Stacey Barrow, and Mike Farino, and they're the ones that make site visits. When you contact our organization, we deploy our circuit riders as quickly as possible. So you get phone calls and site visits and Zoom calls as um, quickly as you need for any of your preservation questions. And that can be about granting or planning issues, demolition, any issues that you're facing with your particular building or in your community. Renee Trebert is our Making Places and Special Projects. She um, administers our Mills website, talks with developers and municipalities about um, rehabbing our wonderful historic industrial sites. And she also coordinates all of our fee-for-service work where we do some contract work for um, national or state register nominations and for historic uh, tax credit applications. Jordan Sorensen is our development and special projects. Jordan works on all of our social media, our outreach, our development and membership, and all of our special projects that include um, the fee-for-service work. And Kristen Hopewood, our development assistant, working on our membership and events and our historic properties exchange. So we have a small but mighty staff and we're supported by a wonderful board of trustees Caroline Sloat, our board chair, is on the call, and Ed Gerber, one of our uh, trustees, is on the call. And if there's anyone else that I've missed, I apologize. <laughs> but our board is great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this uh, series of noontime chats helps us continue our mission in these strange COVID times. We are so used to being out in the community and talking with people and meeting. So this is a chance to bring some uh, educational programming to our audiences and, and introduce you to um, our partners and their work and also to hear from you and hear what um, questions you have and any issues that you have in your community that you'd like to uh, talk about or get some uh, extra help with. Um, so our mission is to protect preserve and promote the building sites and landscapes that contribute to the heritage and vitality of Connecticut communities. And as I said, we've refreshed our vigor and do, when we re, uh, refreshed our brand this January, we didn't change our mission, we just uh, refreshed our, our outlook. So let me advance one more. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Elizabeth Moore, Executive Director of Connecticut Farmland Trust. Great, thank you. I don't know how this works. So what, what people are seeing, how does that? So they should be seeing your screen. That's the full screen? Yep. Because I'm just seeing a little. Okay. Um, 
So thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I've been with Connecticut Farmland Trust uh, since 2004, which is pretty scary. Uh, I started as the director of conservation and then I became executive director five years ago. It might have been six years ago. I lose track. Uh, and I have to say that my heart really is in land conservation, um, even though I'm now, now on the administrative of side of running a nonprofit. Um, so I've been in the conservation field 25 years. People always wonder sort of how you get started in something like this. And I really got started out of a love of my mother's family's property um, on the Maumee River in Northwest Ohio. And it had been in my family for 120 years. And I always knew, as my family knew, um, especially my mother, her sister, and my grandparents on my mother's side, um, that we never wanted it to be developed. And at the age of 10, I was very passionate about that. And I had absolutely no idea that you could actually do this as a profession. And I'm very fortunate to have protected the property um, 10 years ago, um, which was a long uh, process um, for a lot of different internal family reasons. Um, and uh, I'm thrilled to finally have been able to do it. And I, because of my experience with my family's property, um, I really have a fondness for properties, a real soft spot in my heart for properties that have been in families for a long period of time and the passion of families who want to see uh, uh, their properties protected, even if they're gonna be, end up going out of the family, which sometimes happens. Uh, at CFT, um, many of the farms that we've protected um, over the years, we've protected 60 farms so far. Um, many of them have been in the family for over 100 years. And we actually, um, some of my favorites, we've actually protected uh, several Kings Grant properties. And, um, and just last month, we protected the first phase of a 500-acre um, dairy in Voluntown on the Rhode Island line that's been owned and farmed by 13 generations. Of, of one family. Um, and that property they want to protect because it will be going out of the family because there is not another generation um, to take the farm on. Um, so I just wanted to give you a quick introduction to CFT so you have the background as to um, who we are, what it is that we do. Um, and then I want to talk about three historic farms that we hold conservation easements on and how the protected land has preserved the context of the agricultural structures on these farms. Uh, and it'll give you a, an idea of the range of projects that we do across the state. One is in a rural part of Southbury. Another one is in, um, let's see, in Vernon in a heavily suburbanized area off I-84. Uh, and then another one is in Stonington. So, and this is be at the point if we were talking live that I would ask in the audience where people were from. So um, I'm just gonna guess that people know um, where all those places are. So, um, okay, good, next slide. Um, no, that's the right slide, okay. So uh, um, Connecticut Farmland Trust was created in 2002. Uh, we're a statewide nonprofit land trust, and we focus exclusively on the permanent protection of agricultural land, what they call working land, uh, working farmland, for current and fu future generations of farmers. And we were created at the height of the real estate market in 2002, when many farms were being lost and they weren't being protected uh, by the state's farmland preservation program. And this was especially to especially true for smaller properties uh, that did not meet uh, the state's criteria. And so more than, um, just a little fact, more than 60% of farms in Connecticut are 49 acres or less. So those were the farms that we were quickly seeing subdivided and being protected. Uh, so there was a need for a private statewide agricultural land trust. And so, um, that's the reason we are created. So fast forward um, 18 years, we've been accredited by the National Land Trust 
Accreditation Commission, we've protected over 4,700 acres uh, on 60 farms. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, and those, those uh, farms range anywhere from four acres to 212 acres. And if we have anybody on the call from Fairfield County, I don't want you to despair because you will notice that you're the only county that doesn't have any protected land um, by Connecticut Farmland Trust. And I'm very pleased to say that um, by Thanksgiving, we'll be protecting a farm, very visible farm in Newtown. And then hopefully by the end of the year, we'll be protecting an apple orchard in Easton. So um, very excited about that. And uh, just as a one thing that people always wonder what type of agriculture we have in Connecticut, um, we really have the breadth, everything from orchards, vegetables, um, dairy, meat, um, uh, ornamentals, um, really basically everything. And 92% of our farms are food producing, which has turned out to be um, especially important in the pandemic because we've seen many uh, people flocking to local farms for safety reasons. All righty, next slide. Um, what is the conservation easement? So this is where I'd, I'd ask people to raise their hands if they know what you know if they know what one is, so we can um, just skip over it. But um, it's a legal mechanism uh, that permanently protects a piece of property. Uh, it's voluntary. Uh, it's also permanent, and that's something that um, we always like to emphasize. And it's all about keeping a farm um, viable and sustainable for future generations. Okay. Good. Let's see. All right. Um, the landowner continues to own the land. Um, they can also uh, lease it. They can sell it. Um, they can gift it. Um, all those things, they, they are just um, selling or donating the ability to develop it. And the property can't be developed for a non-agricultural use. Uh, so there can be no industrial development. There can only be... Um, Commercial, the only commercial development that can happen is commercial agriculture. No other type of commercial development can happen. Um, and the only residential development that is allowed is if it has been agreed upon in advance. For example, um, we sometimes have farm families that want to reserve a site uh, for a, an additional house for a child or something like that. And uh, easements can be sold or donated um, we, for whatever reason, have been seeing an uptick in donated easements. Um, and, um, and also just in terms of easements being sold, that we, uh, we do purchase easements. Um, as you all know from personal experience, land is extremely expensive in Connecticut. We have some of the, the highest um, land costs in the country. And so as I go through these projects, you know, we'll talk about purchase price, just so you have an idea of uh, basically what a, a land trust is up against when they're looking to purchase a conservation easement on properties. We do do bargain sales, which means um, we purchase at below market value, um, but uh, those don't happen that often. So, um, but we love all of our landowners regardless whether it's a purchase or donated. So let's see, what's our next slide? Um, so partnerships are key for the very reason that I said that land is so expensive in Connecticut. Um, it, is, it is more possible when that there are many different parties to take a bite at the pie. So we work with federal agencies, state agencies, municipalities, local land trusts um, often. Sometimes we work with other um, non-conservation groups, neighborhood groups, that's not as common, but we do do that. And also foundations are very key. There are some that do fund land conservation. And also um, most projects do involve, um, and all three of the ones I'm gonna talk about actually, all involve um, private fundraising campaigns. So next. Okay, so I am gonna focus um, 
most of my most of my talk about on Phillips Farm in Southbury, which is one of my um, one of my favorites. Um, I actually did this project when I was at the Trust for Public Land, um, which was way back in what 1999 to 2003. And then ultimately when the property was protected, the easement was transferred to Connecticut Farmland Trust. So um, Phillips Farm, I don't know if anybody's been there, but it's 95 acres. It was originally part of an um, almost 250,000 um, acre farm. And it was established in the 1690s by one of the founding families of Old Woodbury and who had extensive holdings in the area that then became Southbury. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Next slide. I don't know if it'll, okay. Oh, and there's, and this is, um, since Southbright Land Trust has owned the property, um, it has continued to be hayed by an adjacent um, dairy farmer. So it has stayed in agricultural um, production um, since the Southbury Land Trust um, uh, uh, purchased it in 2002. Uh, next slide. So um, two of the farmhouses that were originally associated with the farm remain. And the one that you're looking at is what is now called Stillmeadow Farm. Uh, that's a current picture, a large picture is a current picture of Stillmeadow Farm. And then the picture up in the corner, which actually is higher quality, um, is from the 30s or 40s. And uh, the reason that Stillmeadow, the name of it may ring a bell with some folks, is that it was the... Um, home of Gladys Tabor, who was, uh, she moved to uh, Southbury in the 1930s from New York City. She was a, a, a writer. She wrote a very popular column about rural life in the Ladies Home Journal. And she's one of these authors that, uh, she still has a worldwide following <laughs> and she has a fan club and uh, fans do show up um, at Still Meadow and uh, go to Phillips Farm. And when actually when we protected the property, we had donations from all over the world of about $60,000. And uh, her family still owns it. The seventh, excuse me, the fourth generation um, is uh, now residing in the house. She has, Gladys would have an 11 year old granddaughter. And uh, just because you guys are historic preservation folks, um, that the house, uh, and the granddaughter didn't know the exact uh, date of when the original house was built, but it was updated, um, she said, between 1750 and 1785. And I didn't include any of the interior pictures, but she has done a remarkable job. The house has not been updated. Um, it has a 1940s kitchen, um, but otherwise the rest of it is um, oh, I see someone's read her books. Um, uh, Gladys, Gladys, you can still find Gladys, um, Gladys uh, titles on Amazon, which is interesting. So, um, and then the next slide. This, this is um, a house. Um, this is one of the farmhouses that um, also was part of the farm. Um, this dates from the early 1800s, and um, those of you at um, Preservation um, Connecticut would probably recognize this because you all uh, hold a facade easement um, on this particular property, and that came out of um, uh, the Trust for Public Land purchased the property. Um, we put a facade easement on it, and then we sold it to a private a private, um, a private buyer. Um, and in all truth, it turned out to be someone who flipped it and um, did some bad things on the interior. Um, but fortunately, the facade, you can't tell from the facade, um, but that was unfortunate. Um, so back in the night, back in the 1990s, um, the the um, the owners of 
this house that we just, I mean, this house that we're looking at right now that you hold the facade easement on and the Still Meadow Farm, they were interested in having the properties listed. And they had an historian come out to do the listing and he was going to do the houses separately as a listing, but um, because of the integrity of the rural context, it was actually listed, um, uh, he submitted it and it was accepted to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And I believe that it's called um, Sanford Road Historic Place. Um, and one of the things that was, um, he was taken by was, um, next slide. Let's see. There we go. Um, this is, you can't really tell here, but this is, a, um, this is a dirt road. It's one of the remaining dirt roads in Southbury. Um, and also because of the surrounding undeveloped land um, and also the outbuildings. So for the, for the um, can we go back a slide? So this particular farm, that, or this particular house, which is now in private ownership, has an amazing collection of original farm structures. And the red barn that you just saw in the prior slide um, has the, it's the original barn with the original hayloft. Um, there is a smaller barn. There's an ice house, smoke house, a scalding cauldron, which as a vegetarian sort of freaks me out. Um, original hand pump and cistern, chicken coop with one of the most exquisite doors I've, I've ever seen, a three-seater outhouse uh, with a seat for a child, um, and a, also the um, foundation of the cider mill. Um, and it was, um, they did have bootleg um, hard cider there during Prohibition, and um, the granddaughter of Gladys Tabor um, tells the story of um, old farmer Phillips um, chasing uh, kids away with a gun um, while um, he, uh, you know, while he had bootleg. Um, so it was listed on the National Register. Uh, we were able to raise a, um, a local, state, and federal funds and then also a very significant local fundraising campaign and were able to purchase the entire property. And once Southbury Land Trust purchased it, then they transferred a conservation easement on the farm to Connecticut Farmland Trust. So could we go back? One slide. So this is, this is now um, what has been protected and um, you see Phillips Farm up at the top, um, at, again, with the bite out of it, which is where um, the, um, a portion of the uh, historic um, listing is. And then the piece down in the corner um, was a piece that was protected um, a couple years later, which is called Lovedell Farm. Uh, Phillips Farm took four years and Lovedell Farm um, uh, took one year. And one of the reasons for that was that the family was um, very moved by what happened with Phillips Farm and were very motivated. And what was very important is they all were on board. <laughs> and so we didn't have two warring factions. And so South Prairie, South Prairie Land Trust has created this amazing preserve of almost 150 acres. Um, if anybody um, hasn't been there, this is just a, a jewel in, in Southbury. I'm obviously very biased because um, I help protect it, but it's one of the, my favorite projects and I've done over 75 and that's one of my favorites. And a neat thing to come out of the protection of this piece is not only the protection um, of buffering the historic, these historic structures, both residential and agricultural, but that it influenced the um, Lovedell family to protect their piece. And also um, that the town of Southbury, which had been very, very um, excited about using their asphalt trucks to pave all the roads in uh, Southbury actually decided um, that 
after this was protected that they wouldn't pave any of their dirt roads. So um, that was a wonderful outcome of that. And I know um, from talking to the granddaughter that um, Preservation Connecticut had a role in that because I think you all uh, wrote a letter to the town of Southbury. And so thank you, because that was um, also preserving the historic context of that particular area. Okay, next slide. And then next slide. Okay, so we're gonna move from rural Southbury uh, to a pretty suburban, though you can't really tell from this picture, um, Vernon. And Vernon, for those of you who don't know it, it's right off 84, it's next to Tolland. I saw somebody ask that question. Um, this is, uh, uh, this particular property is right in the center of town um, and is, is highly visible and is much loved by people um, in town and everybody, everybody knows it because of its iconic um, buildings. It's 51 acres, uh, it was established in 1878 and it is one of the three remaining uh, active farms in Vernon. Uh, one of the two others we protected in 2016 called Gunther Farm, which is right on the Tolland um, Vernon line. Um, next slide. So this is the homestead of um, Strong Family Farm and uh, the original um, uh, house, um, farm, farmstead, um, exists. It's seven bedrooms. And then down in the corner, you also see the original barn. And this is what Strong Farm is really known for, is this very iconic uh, yellow barn. And, and that dates to, I believe, the early or the late 1800s. Uh, it's a former dairy barn. Um, it's been very well maintained. And also Preservation Connecticut, I'm trying to think, maybe 10 years ago, um, gave uh, the family a grant um, to do some architectural um, studies on the property, uh, architectural studies on the barn before it was renovated. Um, so this one also has a very familiar story. Uh, the patriarch died. Uh, the property went to his uh, children. I believe there were four, also to nieces and nephews. Um, pro-development, pro-conservation folks didn't come up with a, um, an agreement on what they wanted to do. Developers were circling once the patriarch died. Um, rumors had it that they attended the funeral, which is not uncommon. Um, very desirable location in the center of town, um, high views from up at the top of Meeting House Hill, and as I said, easy access off 84. So, um, the, let's see, next slide. So this is a picture. Um, the red and yellow are the pieces of Strong Family Farm that were protected. And the black is the original Strong Family Farm. So land between, you can see right below Strong Family Farm. Um, you can probably see ball fields. That's the high school um, and then all those ball fields. So a lot of land around Strongly, Strong Family Farm um, was sold from the original farm. However, you can imagine that the context, while these pieces of the farm that remain are not immediately adjacent, they also keep some of the character of what the farm was like. And so these pieces um, are still farmed. I'll get to that in a second, but these, these two pieces that were protected um, are still farmed. So what happened, it was really quite a remarkable story that a small group of, of neighbors who were concerned about seeing it protected put up their own money. Some of them put up their retirement funds and bought it for $1 million um, with, the, with the expectation that they would be able to sell it for conservation. So there what 
is described as a conservation buyer um, or, you know, a manna from heaven, an angel. Um, we were incredibly fortunate because you can't, as many of you know, put together funding in uh, that quickly. Um, getting, putting together public funding can take two to three years. So um, Connecticut Farmland Trust purchased the 51 acres in these, in the red and yellow, it's 51 total acres of, of field and pasture. We um, purchased um, those two pieces um, from the investors, these neighbors, um, so they were made whole. Um, we put together um, town, state, and federal funding. Um, Connecticut Farmland Trust and the local land trust contributed funding. And uh, this is quite wonderful that 470 people in a townwide campaign contributed just shy of $50,000, 470 people. Um, the gifts ranged in anywhere from $5 to $4,000. Most of them were below $100. Um, I mean, that almost brings me to tears. I mean, it shows you how important this particular property was to the town of Vernon. So that property is now permanently protected. And we transferred these fields that we hold a conservation easement on them. We transferred the fields to Strong Family Farm, which is um, a nonprofit, which does agriculture and environmental education programming. They now own the original farmstead, which is outlined in black. We transferred the pastures and fields back to them for a dollar. So uh, they, uh, you know, the, the farm is back together. Um, the family farm is back together. It's now um, all owned by a nonprofit and it's permanently protected. And uh, that is a jewel. Um, it's a wonderful place to go see um, if you have the opportunity. So um, next slide. And that's a um, that's just a view of Meeting House Hill, um, uh, one of the one of the high points of the property where it would have been very desirable for development because of because of its views. Um, let's see next. So our final our final farm, and I'm I'm don't want to. Um, I would only want to pronounce the name if I could do justice. <laughs> I'm, I'm just gonna say Rathbun Farm um, because that is the name of the owner. Um, I don't wanna butcher the name. So this is, it's a 44 and a half acre farm uh, in Stonington. It's right on a cove. It was established in 1652 by a land grant. And it's been in the same family uh, for nine generations. And let's see, okay, there you can see it. Um, that is, I'm not gonna say that's an original barn, but it is a very, very old barn. Uh, it was used partially as a dairy barn. Um, it is used minimally now for agriculture. Um, it is extremely well maintained. Um, the owner of the property is very uh, proud of uh, his heritage and he believes strongly in uh, maintaining the structures. And uh, all I can say is I wish I had windows as beautiful as the ones he put in to replace the broken ones in my house. Uh, they were uh, done beautifully. It's just, it's a, it's, this is an incredibly iconic property and is um, almost causes accidents because so many people stop. It's on a, on a curve, um, stop to take pictures because it's so iconic. Um, let's see, next picture. This is the original farmhouse um, and it, dates um, between 1710 and 1740. Um, it does have an extension. Um, I don't know the date of it. Um, as we're facing this off to the left, um, but it has been very, its historic integrity has been very well maintained. Um, the owner wants to protect the property. This one has not been protected yet. Um, the owner wants to protect the property because he's gonna be passing it to his two children 
He wants to make sure that uh, they uh, keep it in the family, which I guess is a way of saying that they don't sell some of it off. Um, and Connecticut Farmland Trust is gonna be purchasing a conservation easement on the entire property. Uh, we're working with the town, um, the state, and when I say the state, I'm talking about the Department of Agricultural um, uh, Preservation, or excuse me, the uh, Department of Agriculture through the State Farmland Preservation Program. And we also have federal funding. Uh, we fell a little short, and so there was also private money that came into this. And the neighbors, uh, 38 neighbors, raised $110,000. So you can, you know, you weigh that against Vernon, where they had 470 um, folks who raised 49,000. Um, 49, so, um, but, you know, you just, it depends on the area that you're in. And so this property... Uh, will be um, protected, knock on wood, um, in the summer of 2021. Um, and this one is, oh, by the way, uh, this is still being farmed. Uh, next slide. This is, um, I think is a gorgeous shot. Um, this, that is the little um, farm stand and uh, and then that's the road going back to the pastures and vegetable fields in the back. Uh, the property is now leased to a beginning farmer, um, a wonderful young man. He's a Yukon grad. Uh, he's in his late 20s, and he has a wildly successful operation. Uh, he sells vegetables, um, flowers, which are arranged by his mother, um, and he also, eggs, um, and he also has limited meat. All these are grown on his property, um, on this property. He sells them at the farm stand and also in some of the farmer's market, um, which what's really fun is that some of it is um, sold um, in, the, in the Stonington farmer's market and the owner of the property is actually the one who mans the stand at the farmer's market. <laughs> he doesn't get paid, he gets paid in tomatoes. Um, and he has a, a long-term lease on the property. Um, so um, when the property does convey um, upon the landowner's death to his children, um, the young farmer will still have a lease there. Um, I believe it's at least a 25 year lease. So um, the landowner is, um, has been a great um, supporter and uh, mentor um, to this young farmer. Let's see, is there another picture? And those are the, those are the vegetable, those are the vegetable fields. And then over on the right, um, a non-historic structure, um, that would be a temp what we would refer to as a temporary greenhouse. Uh, it is not, it's not permanent because it doesn't have footings and it doesn't have a floor. Uh, it's literally uh, a year-round tent uh, sitting on um, soil and it's a, a very common, um, it's, it's a very common, um, they're very commonly used by farmers um, to extend their growing season because they can um, start plants early and they can also um, sell things later into the season if they um, are growing them in one of their greenhouses that, and they also can have high tunnels. Um, next. Oh, that's what I thought. I thought it was the chicken. Um, and those are some of um, the farmers that uh, excuse me, the farmers. Those are some of the chickens at, at Rathbun Farm. They seem to be very happy chickens. So um, there's my contact information. Um, and and um, even during COVID, um, I can access my, um, that's my work phone number, and um, I can access my voicemail because uh, right now I'm operating out of what I refer to as the Regional Office of Connecticut Farmland Trust in my dining room in <laughs> Haven um, with my four-legged co-workers. So um, I would love to open it up to questions if anybody has questions. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was fantastic.
great. Yeah, very nice. There was one question that came through the chat. Um, you gave us examples of some pretty large farmsteads. Do uh, Connecticut uh, Farmland Trust have easements on smaller parcels, like seven acre farms? We Yes, we per have protected um, one relatively recently, I don't know, two to three years ago, uh, we protected um, a, a, a vegetable operation in Lyme. Um, it is uh, wildly successful. Um, they uh, do what they call, what's called community supported agriculture, CSA. Some of you might um, have, a mem have a subscription at a farm um, where you get vegetables through the season. Um, and one of our first, actually our very protected farm uh, was 16 and a half acre orchard in Glastonbury. Um, we have another like five acre piece in Hamden, which is actually a Christmas tree operation. Um, let's see. I think, I think those, those, and then we have like a 22 acre, um, if anybody um, knows Beltane Farm, exquisite goat cheese, uh, they recently stopped um, uh, selling uh, cheese, um, which is a bummer because it was really, really good goat cheese. That was like 22 acres. And um, so that's, uh, those are about the, those are, on the, those are the smaller ones. But uh, so the question, it seemed to, my guess is that somebody must know a small property and what, is important for us is that it's an active farm. And so um, the proof is like in Lyme that that's a wildly uh, successful operation because they're doing vegetables and that is a sustainable business. And then if you had, which nobody would, but let's pretend you had a four acre dairy, not successful you would probably under zoning be able to have two cows. So not a successful dairy. So um, it really depends on the operation, but um, we, we definitely do protect smaller properties and um, we have a special interest in protecting them, like I said, because other entities don't. And so that's one of the reasons we do them. And thank you, I saw somebody gave a shout out for Bristol's farm. Yay, that was a great, that was a great project. That was a wonderful project. Um, I have a question, unless yeah, somebody go, else does. Go ahead. Uh, oh, okay. Um, th this has to be a working farm uh, for, or can it be a historic farm house, just the house on half an acre? That's way too small, right? Well, we, we really focus on the land. On the land, okay, okay. And, um, and oftentimes structures, historic structures come with the property and we feel strongly that a farm should have housing with it because uh, you can't really have a farm if the farmer doesn't have a place without to- Without a farmer. Right. Okay. So, and so, uh, I understand, okay. So we're preserving this house, but it used to be a farmhouse. So um, I'm very interested, how did you get the community to raise so much money? I mean, how did, what were your fundraising avenues to get a community to say, this farm, this building, et cetera, is worth saving? Because I have something I really think the town of Norwich can get behind. Well, what did you do? I, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I, one of the most important things I would say right off the bat is that people have to care if it's going to be developed and oh. if, if it's at if it's not a visible property it is it well that's but i'm just saying if it's oh, not okay. property then it's extremely hard to fundraise for but if it's a visible property and people would care that they would that they would miss it that 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 first off is extremely important um, it also helps when you when you start a public, this is really any fundraising campaign, 
when you start, you already have a lot of money lined up. And so when we went public in, in Phillips Farm, the one in Southbury, we already knew that we were getting state and federal funding, which was a huge chunk of it, a huge chunk of the 1.25 million. Um, we, we were able to leverage that um, uh, guilt. You know, we, we got the town on board for I think 250,000 as a result. So people like to get on a winning campaign. And so it's always good to start and being able to say, uh, you're gonna close it out. You're going to help us get over, um, uh, you know, get to the finish line. So when you see those thermometers, you want it to be, you already want a lot of red um, and just that little bit of white to cover. Elizabeth, I'm going to write you an email because I really need your help <laughs> and I don't want to take up more time. So sure, thank happy. you so much. Thank you. Happy to. Happy okay. to. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Nanette. Uh, Jane, do you hear me? I can hear you, Ed. Oh, good. I had a couple of questions. Sure, go ahead. Hi. Where is she? <laughs> now I'm looking at myself. Anyway, uh, thank you. What, what, an, what a fascinating uh, uh, discussion. And you have the best photographer. I've never seen such a good looking cow as we, we saw in one of those pictures. Even, <laughs> even, even the way the rocks are displayed was, I mean, I have a stone wall. It doesn't look anything like that. I need, I need help with that. And that anyway, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a farm to go see. That's a spectacular. Indeed, thing. indeed. Um, do you have a list of the locations of your protected properties? Is that something that you make public? Yes, it's on our website. Oh, it is. Okay. Um, our website that's being revised, but it is, but it is on there. You'll see. You'll actually see the map that I showed at the very beginning, and then below that there is a list of all of the farms. Oh, good. Thanks. And you can click on them, and then it has details about them. Because some of them are, are open for, for people to walk through, I guess. Yes, yeah, some of the ones that are owned by land trusts. Yeah. Uh, the ones that are owned by land trusts, uh, there's some in uh, Southbury, uh, let's see, Southbury, New Milford. Um, I should remember all this, but um, no, it's okay. the ones that are owned by land trusts are open for public access. Another one in Watertown. Um, those are open for public access. Um, they have walking trails um, most of the time on the perimeter of the fields or uh, in the woods. Um, and uh, Gunther, um, Gunther Farm in Vernon, um, Strong Farm in, Vern in, in Vernon. Um, and then th the other farms uh, that have not been protected with state money, um, for those of some of you may know uh, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection's open space grants um, must require public access. So the farms that have not been protected with uh, that money do not have public access. And typically the farmers don't want that. <laughs> want it, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> I, I, I live in, in the, the area that had no, no activity, at least current activity Fairfield? with you in uh, Fairfield County. But I wondered if one of the reasons for that is because of Asp Aspetuck Land Trust, which is so um, active here. So many of hey. us belong to it. Yes, that is a wonderful land trust. And they just bought Gilberti's farm. Which yeah, it's great. <laughs> Huge acquisition, very big. Um, well, I think there are really a couple reasons. And one of them is because uh, the land prices, to be quite honest with you. Mm -hmm. but, um, and the state who puts in um, the vast majority of the funding for land preservation in Connecticut, um, uh, how do I put this? Um, they're looking for bang for their buck. And, um, and I think in some ways, unfortunately, there's been a turn um, uh, um, that, that has um, um, not, not been good for Fairfield. Um, 
And uh, Easton, for example, as you may know, lots of little farms. Um, that's oh, where we're protecting a piece right now. Um, and we're also, the, the other piece we're protecting is in Newtown. Yeah. A lot of agriculture up there. Um, the, the only stuff that's been protected by the state in Fairfield County is in Shelton, uh, the Fairmount in Shelton. Um, but the other thing is just because of the development pressure, because of the proximity to New York City, the farms, uh, there are few and uh, there aren't many, there aren't many viable farms is one of the, is one of the tricks. And so um, as you move, um, as you move closer to New Haven, um, that's when you're seeing um, more farms. But it, that's one of the, it's the, it's the cost, it's the cost, and it's also just not uh, uh, few viable farms, unfortunately. Right. Well, my, my last question is, do other New England states have uh, farmland trusts like yours? And are you a uh, membership organization? Yes, we are. Yo, I love that. What a uh -oh. great Jane, I'm sorry I asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, nonprofit. Um, yes, Maine Farmland Trust, wonderful, wonderful organization. Um, very, very good for anybody with connection to Maine. Um, Vermont Land Trust has uh, what has Vermont Land Trust, and a majority of what they protect is agricultural land. Um, that's a phenomenal land trust, one of the um, uh, best in the country, I would say. Um, New Hampshire does not have a statewide agricultural land trust. Um, Massachusetts has some very good agricultural land trusts um, in Western Mass, which strangely enough is considered anything west of the suburbs of Boston. But <laughs> Um, there's some very good agricultural land trusts out there. Um, Rhode Island, um, and there are very, very high prices, land prices in Rhode Island. Um, there is not a statewide agricultural land trust. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. You're welcome. I saw somebody was interested in Gladys Tabor. Oh, yeah. Who is that? <laughs> Tim, did you have a question? You have to unmute yourself. Uh, is that better? No. Yes, now we yes. can hear you. Oh, all right, good. Um, in Enfield, my family has been uh, dairy farmers for six generations now. And my brother runs the, the farm at this mm -hmm. point. And, uh, I've lived in New York and Los Angeles for the last four years, and I'm back in Enfield now. Uh, and um, the, my brother's farm uh, is just 22 acres at this point, and he has a herd there and does his own mill, all this stuff. He does I, quite I, a bit there. But your now, brother is Mike. Yes. Mike Trinity Mike. Dairy. Yes, that's right. Yes. Excellent coffee milk, yes? Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's for good. <laughs> um, there is a property, a, a farm that borders uh, Smith uh, uh, Dairy, and mm -hmm. it's now for sale. It's mm -hmm. uh, been for sale for four acres. My brother could really use that property, uh, mm -hmm. but... Um, they certainly want quite a bit of money for that one point. Uh, is it on the road? Is it on King's Highway? Yes. Okay. I, I know the, the property. Yes. I know the property. Yep. It's the Carson Farm, and we've yep. known them forever and ever, you know. But, I met with the guy once. Oh, Richie? Yeah. Okay. And um, I've talked to them, and mm -hmm. you know, there isn't any big news about the property at this point. Um, because, you know, this is kind of a strange time to be thinking about buying a piece of property. But um, I would like to see it preserved, certainly, as a farm. And uh, I would like to buy the property, but uh, in terms of, you know, where we are this year and all of a sudden, uh, I can't do that at the moment. 
Um, but uh, that's the thought. You know, my my nephew has uh, mowed the 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 hay fields there for a, a number of years, and it's very good property. It's very good uh, fertile soil, and we'd like to uh, keep it uh, going. Um, but it uh, it certainly brings up a lot of questions. Yes, and I I hate to tell you, um, Enfield. Wow, lousy planning in Enfield. They are, they are not um, ag friendly. They're not preservation friendly. They are uh, what, it, what I call big box warehouse friendly. They are very, um, they've, they've developed exquisite farmland off I-91 with those huge warehouses for BJs. Um, I know. And you know everybody, and Our it's marching family. down that. You know. Yeah, it's marching down safe. that road. Yeah. And I wonder, do you know how how that property, um, the Carson property, is zoned? Because I don't remember. Do you know how it's zoned? Yeah, uh, R forty four, something like that. It's still agricultural oh, it is, right now. All right. Well, at least it's still residential because commercial industrial has been moving down that road. Um, how long did you say it's been on the market? About six weeks, maybe. Oh, only six weeks. Okay. Um, well, I would be happy to talk to you offline. Um, I do. Yeah, that, that would be great. Yeah, I would be happy to happy to talk with you. Okay. I know exactly the property you're talking about, and I'm almost positive that um, I met with him with your brother. Oh, okay. Yeah. But this would have been a while ago, before your nephew's accident, like before that. Yeah, okay. I'm also in the process of uh, uh, rehabilitating or renovating uh, a barn, a barn built in 1865 that is, uh, is not involved in this property, but mm -hmm. it's down the street on uh, King Street. And we'll talk about that too. <laughs> okay. Yes, please call me. Please okay. call me. Thanks. I would love to see something happen for Trinity Dairy. I would love to see that happen. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks, Tim. Keep that coffee milk coming. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they sell it at the Whitneyville market. So oh, I have really? seen oh, really? that too. <laughs> um, Steve Jones sent a question into the chat. Um, how can conservation commissions and agriculture commissions work together to effectively preserve farmland as potentially mixed use, passive recreation and farm use? Okay. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so is what agricultural commissions and conservation commission? Is that what it was? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I, I would say, um, Probably, if you wanted to stay in agricultural production, uh, pub, it's best to keep public access separate. And uh, Phillips Farm is a, a good example. Um, if we were to look back at the map um, way back at the beginning, that the all of the trails that are on that property are all on the um, perimeter and they're in, um, by the way, that property has old growth forest that um, it has all of the, the trails are um, in the woods. And so that if, if a, a town were interested um, since both a conservation commission and cultural commission are town, that if a town was interested in purchasing a property, uh, that would be one way to uh, structure it so that the um, ag um, land and the open space are kept separate. Um, and one of, one of the issues, I, I mean, I will have to say is that all of the properties that we hold easements on that are that have public access are owned by land trusts. They're not owned by a private individual, in other words, a farmer. Um, they, many of these land trusts 
uh, lease them to farmers. But a farmer, um, I don't know of any farmer who um, would uh, sell an ease sell an easement that granted public access. Um, actually, no, I do know one. We, what am I smoking? We do have one. We have one in Sharon. And, um, and what's interesting is that the trail is up on the top of a ridge that's full of rattlesnakes. It's one of two spots in Connecticut that has the endangered um, uh, rattlesnake. And frankly, no, the public doesn't go up there because of the rattlesnakes. So they don't really have to worry about public access. But um, most, um, most farmers don't want public access. So that if, if somebody is looking to protect a farm where they uh, public access is important, and, and that's often important for selling um, to uh, Board of Finance and Board of Selectmen, um, the idea of putting in municipal money, uh, they want public access and exchange, then it needs to be very carefully thought out as to where the public access would go. But I'd be happy to talk to you about it because there are certainly ways that it can be done if you have the right type of property. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Last chance for some questions. We've gone over time. Want to unmute yourself and ask a question? I just want to say really quickly, thank you for preserving the Lovedal farm because I grew up two minutes up the road from that and we used to get our hay from Mr. Lovedal. Is and that, I, that's Hall's Hill Road, right? I grew up on Burr Road right at the top okay, okay. of Hall's Hill. Yep. And uh, we used to get our hay from him and I remember him very fondly. So it's it's a great property. Well, thank you. I'm really pleased. I, I, I hope that you're a member of the Southbury Land Trust because they do uh, just spectacular work. And um, I'm actually working with them on another project, which we're hoping to pull out of the ditch because um, it needs uh, $176,000. But um, it's in, obviously in Southbury, but um, they are an amazing land trust. Um, they're, they're one of, you know, a handful that do... Um, agricultural preservation um, in Connecticut. So um, wonderful. I'm glad you know it. That's a wonderful property. And I did have one question too. Um, yeah. How do you connect the landowners with the farmers that you eventually, that they eventually lease the properties to? Do you help with that connection or is it something that they form on their own? Wow, you're like a plant in the audience. What a great Sorry. question. We, um, <laughs> We do. We actually um, manage um, for the state uh, something called FarmLink, which the best way to describe it is Match.com for farmers and land. And so people that are looking to lease or sell farmland, as well as farmers that are looking to buy or lease farmland, um, can make a match. And so um, there are listings um, for both properties for sale and lease as well as for those people who are looking. And um, there are more people looking than there are properties listed. And so, um, and that's a bummer during COVID because this is when we would be doing outreach and it's, you know, tough to do it um, via, via Zoom. But um, that's our, that's what we're really focusing on right now is getting more listings on Farm Lake, especially of properties that are looking uh, to uh, lease or sell, or landowners that are looking to lease or sell farmland. But it's called Farm Link, and um, you can find it on our website. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for asking the question. You're like a plant in the audience. <laughs> Just like the gentleman who asked if we're a membership organization. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of money, um, this would be a good time to 
make a plug for the Community Investment Act. Um, yes. Many of you might know that farmland, historic preservation, open space, and affordable housing receive significant funding from the state through the Community Investment Act. And that's a fee that's generated off of real estate transactions. And um, it's really important to make sure your legislators all know how much this funding impacts your communities directly through all of those four sectors. And we're always um, working with Elizabeth and our other partners on the Community Investment Act Coalition to make sure that the legislators continue to support this designated fund. Um, sometimes that money looks tempting in difficult uh, fiscal times. So we we'll have to be sure we have a, a strong presence at the legislature to keep that funding flowing to our communities because it does come directly into our communities for all of these great programs. And I can tell you that Strong Family Farm, um, that received a grant from you all for the barn. So that would have been CIA money. Um, also that that money that was protected with state open space money. So that was um, Community Investment Act money. And then also um, Rathbun Farm, uh, um, there's a good chance that their state funding from the Department of Agriculture is CIA funding. Yes, such an important program. It is. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And I am so happy that my four-legged co-workers didn't. <laughs> it's rather shocking. So we will post this on our YouTube channel, a recording of this, and we can send out the uh, slide deck too as a PDF. There are some additional um, resources at the end of the slide deck that you might find useful. And next week, we're going to switch gears and talk about mid-century moderns. Um, Jenny Schofield from the State Historic Preservation Office, Bruce Becker, a developer of the Pirelli Building in New Haven, and uh, uh, who do I have? Oh, and Bob Grexon will be joining us as well. So we hope you'll join us next week and we'll continue our discussion. Thanks everyone for joining us and thank you, Elizabeth. Thank we'll you. you again Bye soon. local. Bye local. Yes. <laughs> Bye all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Call me, Tim. Yeah, I will. <laughs> <All right. laughs>